They tell you to kill someone. Did you think of saying no? Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking at 20 disturbing interviews with killers. I don't know if I have any feelings. I don't think any, I mean, uh, maybe, maybe that's my birth defect. For this video, we're looking at the most troubling interview footage with accused or convicted killers. Have you seen any of these? Let us know in the comments. Richard Kuklinski. How many people have you killed? I'm an approximate guess. Approximate will go with more than 100. Richard Kuklinski, AKA the Iceman, has been the subject of multiple documentaries over the years and even a feature film. The validity of his claims has been questioned, specifically the large number of contract killings in which Kuklinski had reportedly taken part. Are there any murders that you committed that, that haunt you, that you just sort of, you feel and you do? Nothing haunts me. Still, this doesn't change the fact that Kuklinski was a startling interview, one that gave credence to his chilling namesake. I then took him and put him in a 50-gallon drum Put it on the side of a, of a motel. Kuklinski does indeed come across as icy and detached within both the Iceman tapes and the Iceman confesses, describing his double life as a devoted family man and cold-hearted killer. Did you like to look them in the eye? I wanted them looking straight at me. Although the Iceman passed away in 2006, his reputation lives on within this disturbing footage. What did you want him to think as they died? Just see my pretty face. Stephen McDaniel. This interview with convicted murderer Stephen McDaniel is chilling for a number of reasons. Yeah, Lauren was my neighbor. Um, we're just trying to find out where she is at this point. I mean, no one has seen her since Saturday. For starters, it's not often that local news audiences get to witness a killer speaking to the press prior to their arrest. McDaniel's demeanor seems busy and energetic as the wheels appear set in motion within his head. The only thing we can think is that maybe she went out running and someone snatched her. He attempts to set up an alibi for himself, although he's soon caught off guard when he learns on camera that part of his victim's remains have been recovered. I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body? Um, had you heard, any, had you seen anything there? At this point, McDaniel stops dead in his tracks, his eyes glaze over, and his reactions say it all. He knows he's been caught. It is surreal to see it all play out in real time. Are you okay, sir? I, I think I need to sit down. Dennis Rader. You know, something drove me to do this. You know, the normal people just don't do this. You can't stop it. I can't stop it. It's just, it controls me. It is the brazen and nonchalant attitude emanating from Dennis Rader that makes this interview with the BTK killer so disturbing. The piece was conducted by Massachusetts psychologist Robert Mendoza, and it took place almost immediately after Raider pled guilty to 10 counts of first-degree murder. I got this fantasy. I started working out this fantasy in my mind. And once that potential, that person became a fantasy, I could just loop, loop it over and lay in bed at night. To hear Raider describe his methodology in such laissez-faire terms is chilling, as BTK details how he would stalk and learn about his potential victims before striking. The stalking stage is when you start learning more about your victims, potential victims. I uh, went to the library, I looked up their names, that address, cross-referenced, and called them a couple of times. He even describes a kit of tools that he would use during the proceedings. Uh, plastic bags, rope, tape, uh, knife, gun. Raider also tells Mendoza that he, quote, couldn't help but commit these crimes. And he muses as to whether or not being dropped on his head as a child resulted in some form of demonic possession. I actually think I'm maybe possessed with demons. Uh, I was dropped on my head when I was a kid. David Berkowitz. When you see somebody radically changed by the power of God, it excites you. Full disclosure, the purpose behind this interview with the son of Sam, David Berkowitz, is a vehicle to showcase the killer's born-again beliefs. Still, the source details are there. I uh, met some guys at a party on, on the block on Barnes Avenue. Well, they seem like nice people, but they were into some kinky stuff with witchcraft and so forth. Berkowitz is interviewed with soft acoustic guitar music in the background and flattering lighting, the exact opposite of what we normally expect from these sorts of interviews. I become convinced over time that my job was to be a soldier for the devil and to bring 
destruction. It's a bit unsettling, this humanizing of the 44 caliber killer who held New York City in the grip of fear back in the 1970s. The bad things that were being done were actually going to be good. But it was, it was just a trick of the enemy. Around the time of this interview, Berkowitz also tried to insinuate that a satanic cult had used him as a pawn in these killings. But a new investigation could not corroborate these claims. They took me out of the car and one of the officers, uh, he said to me, uh, are you glad this is over? And I looked at him and, and I was says, yeah, I'm very glad. And they were all like taken aback. Peter Sutcliffe. Jack wasn't the only ripper in England. Could it be then that the man that you're looking for is a maniac? It could be so. Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, terrorized the areas of Manchester and West Yorkshire between 1975 and 1980. Quite certain that this man hates prostitution. Sutcliffe targeted sex workers or women he perceived as being involved in such business. Although his criteria for such assumptions could be something as innocuous as a woman being out in the early morning. I hit with a branch or something, threw it over a wall. And I climbed over the wall and I was, I was, I was thinking of bumping her off and this voice said, stop, stop. Sutcliffe's various phone interviews with officials and the media lean into the Ripper's violent and misogynist views, to the point where he callously labels one of his victims as being in, quote, the wrong place at the wrong time. Did you have a lot of regrets when you killed Jane MacDonald, a 16-year-old? Yes, I did, yeah. She was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Sutcliffe even went so far as to refer to his victims as, quote, filth during his confession to police. On the night you were arrested, were you going to attack the girl you were with? Of course I was. That was the whole point. Peter Curtin. Peter Curtin was dubbed the Vampire of Dusseldorf due to the killer's reputation for savagery, as well as his fixation on blood. Although this interview report dates all the way back to Curtin's execution on July 1st, 1931, and has admittedly fallen into the realm of nebulous urban legend, the legacy is no less chilling. Curtin was speaking with a prison psychologist while awaiting the guillotine when he asked whether or not he would shortly thereafter be able to hear the sound of his own blood. His head currently resides at Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in Wisconsin as an exhibit attraction. Samuel Little. It's infuriating to think that a serial killer can go on killing for so long that they can eventually just slow down due to old age. So then this opportunity popped up, mm -hmm. take her to the store. Right. Instead of me bringing her back to the apartment, I went down to the cellar seat. Samuel Little possessed the largest confirmed victims list in U.S. history, beginning way back in 1970, if not sooner. Little continued his murderous ways for over 30 years until he was finally apprehended, thanks to advances in modern forensic pathology. So you basically roll her into a pretty big ditch that's got a bunch of... Well, it wasn't a ditch, it was a slope. Okay. That didn't look like a slope because of the vegetation. This career criminal never showed remorse for his behavior either. The official FBI YouTube account has a wealth of confessions from Little all of which feature the killer's relaxed, almost self-satisfied attitude. So I, I pulled her out of the car. She's too big for me to carry, carry her, so I just pulled her out of the car and laid her on that trash that was lit. Sammy Gravano. They tell you to kill someone. Did you think of saying no? So many true crime aficionados study the interviews of serial killers, but the stories from the underworld of organized crime can be equally chilling. I was doing loan shopping stealing cars, doing burglaries, break an arm here, break a leg there. Take, for example, the story of Sammy the Bull Gravano. The Bull was a notorious Gambino family underboss who broke the organization's code of silence in speaking to officials and testifying as a government witness against mob boss John Gotti. I was betrayed, I betrayed him. That's what the mob is. Gravano's own demeanor during this 1997 interview with Diane Sawyer is a mix of frankness and arrogance as he describes a life of contract killing. The next day when we met, they were told, don't back off, don't run, even if there's cops, kill them. The bull story feels just as cinematic as The Godfather, a stranger than fiction story of true organized crime. I remember something that surprised me that I had no remorse at all. Diane Downs. The case of Diane Downs is one steeped in trauma and violence, a situation of loss for everyone involved. 
Downs was convicted for killing one of her children and making attempt on the other two on May 19, 1983. I'm going to remember that night for the rest of my life, whether I want to or not. I don't think I was very lucky. I think my kids were lucky. Downs has claimed in interviews, such as this 1984 piece from KEZI Eyewitness News, that she was herself the victim of abuse as a child. How did your childhood affect you? Everything that happens to you as a child contributes to how you turn out as an adult. Um, to be honest, it made me a better person because I know all the mistakes. I know not what not to do to my kids. However, Downs also attempted to play off her attack as a random crime perpetrated by a carjacker. I was on the driver's side of the car when I was shot, and that's why it was so, I'm going, it was planted. Additionally, her demeanor in this interview exudes the sense of calm, with plenty of smiles and very specific recollections about the incident. It's chilling stuff. A lot of people, when something traumatic happens to them, they suppress immediately. I kept those memories because I knew that I was the only person that was going to be able to tell them what happened when we got to the hospital. Wesley Allen Dodd. Well, I wrote when I filed the case on this guy, locked this guy up forever. There is a shocking matter-of-factness within almost every interview containing sound bites from Wesley Allen Dodd. Moved to Seattle on June 13, 1987. I tried to kidnap a boy. The convicted killer and predator was known for saying point blank that he would kill again if set free. They suggested that I get counseling but didn't think anything was serious enough to press charges. Dodd was so intent on underlying his crimes and behavior that he even stressed on multiple occasions that he deserved the death penalty. Why do you want to be executed? Uh, I have to be. Uh, is I will kill again. Dodd never shied away from detailing his criminal past, recounting how he'd been committing horrible crimes of violence since he was very young. Eventually, Dodd got his wish, as he was executed on January 5, 1993. One thing wasn't exciting anymore. I had to do something else to, to get that old feeling of excitement back. John Wayne Gacy. The Netflix documentary The John Wayne Gacy Tapes did a lot to point out the notorious serial killer's sociopathic tendencies when it came to shifting blame for his accused crimes. Shoelacing, huh? You're in trouble now. <laughs> yeah, right. Aren't you afraid sitting that close to me? This wasn't the first time evidence to that end has come out, however, as documented by this piece from CBS News to Chicago back in 1992. I, I don't see, I don't believe in hitting, hitting children. I don't believe in, in uh, spoiling a child either. My, my values are, su are crazy, such that if you give enough you, love to the children... You're accused of murdering 33 kids and you say you didn't believe in hitting. Interviewer Walter Jacobson doesn't need to do much talking in his encounter with Gacy, as it quickly becomes clear that the former Pogo the Clown is trying his best to present alibi after alibi for his innocence. Bukovic is not one that I killed, so I don't know nothing about him. Gacy himself is composed for the most part, although there is a moment where he demonstrates his infamous rope trick with a shoelace that echoes the methodology of his horrible crimes. And you just turn this, and I says it causes an tourniquet. I said, that's the only knot I ever learned. Precisely the kind of knot found on the ropes. Ted Bundy. Time can change many things about a person, including how they behave while being interviewed. The Ted Bundy featured in a 1977 jailhouse interview from KUTV News appears more in line with the suave yet cold-blooded reputation Bundy had among other notorious serial killers. You feel that everything will turn out all right, that you are innocent. Do you still feel that? Yeah, more than ever. He smiles a lot during the piece and displays body language that appears relaxed and almost happy. I'm not guilty. <laughs> does, that, does that include the time I stole a comic book when I was five years old? Bundy keeps eye contact with his interview throughout most of their conversation, and it's easy to become lulled into a false sense of security, which was exactly Ted's intention. If, if, there's, if, if someone's crazy enough and nutty enough to do something like that, I, I can't stop them. There's nothing I can do. Fast forward to the night before his execution, and we see a fearful and pensive Ted Bundy, a man seeking to shift blame for his crimes during his interview with Christian conservative evangelist James Dobson. There are forces that loose in, in, in this country, particularly, again, uh, this kind of violent uh, pornography. Richard Ramirez. The Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, may be one of the most frightening serial killers of all time, not only due to the brutality of his crimes, but also the projected aura of what many perceive to be pure evil. Yes, I am evil. 
not 100%, but I am evil. It's easy to see why during some of Ramirez's more notable interviews over the years, including one conducted with author Mike Watkiss. Serial killers do on a small scale what governments do on a large one. They are a product of the times, and these are bloodthirsty times. Ramirez's somewhat tense responses to Watkiss's questioning imply a coiled rage, an anger that's also exemplified by the Night Stalker's breathing as he seems to become annoyed with Watkiss. I'll tell you what, I gave up on love and happiness a long time ago. Why? I, I don't care to explain that. Let, let, the, let the quote stand for itself. Ramirez is comparatively more relaxed during a piece with Inside Edition, although that interview also hammers home the Night Stalker's obsession with Satanism, evil, and the occult. I believe in the, in the evil in human nature. This is a wicked, wicked world, and uh, in a wicked world, you, wicked people are born. Edmund Kemper. There's something truly bone-chilling about the matter-of-fact way in which the co-ed killer, Edmund Kemper, describes his past in the 1981 documentary, The Killing of America. Everything went towards killing him, and I didn't. But I'm saying, wow, it's uncanny. It was almost like it was meant to be that way. And I said, wow, I've got, this got to stop. Kemper's impressive intellect and well-spoken nature belie the brutality of a man who committed his first murder at the age of 15. And if it had been in a city, I would have been a mass murderer at age 15. I would have killed until they gunned me down. I wouldn't have been able to reason my way out of it. The killer even makes a self-referential joke to his modus operandi of picking up hitchhikers by putting on a pair of glasses and asking the camera whether they would get into a car with him. Now, would you get in the car with this man? Huh? Kemper's mental state comes across as perpetually active, like a bubbling pot of water about to boil over, while the documentary's exploitative narration pushes the creep factor of this one over the top. I am an American, and I killed Americans. I am a human being, and I killed human beings. And I did it in my society. Jeffrey Dahmer. There's no barely repressed rage within the demeanor of Jeffrey Dahmer as he discusses his history with interviewer Stone Phillips. And I acted on my fantasies, and uh, that's where everything went wrong. Nor are there any wild, headline-grabbing theatrics. Instead, Dahmer's quiet and soft-spoken recounting of his horrible crimes lends the piece that much more power. The only motive that there ever was was to completely control a person a person that I found physically attractive. There's the power of shock as he discusses the failed attempts at creating, quote, living zombies with the remains of his victims. The killing wasn't, wasn't the objective. I just wanted to have the person under my complete control. There's also the power of how Dahmer's moments of shocking violence are undercut by the killer's regret for the decisions he made, and the futility of what seemed to be a date with infamy and destiny. Once it happened the first time, it just seemed like uh, it had control of my life from there on in. Gary Ridgway. Gary Ridgway, AKA the Green River Killer, was one of the most prolific of all American serial murderers. Well, I whipped out my ID, and with my ID would be my, I put my finger over my driver's license to hide my name. Ridgway was also perhaps one of the most unrepentant, a sentiment that's placed front and center during any of his interviews. A uh, picture of my son, David, no, I was a probably normal person. Take, for example, one he did with FBI psychopathy profiler Mary Ellen O'Toole, where he very calmly describes how he would gain the trust of his victims. The only thing that would be better than that would be to have your son in the car with you. That, that would be an a, a incredible ruse. Uh, that happened once. O'Toole manages to get Ridgway talking in depth about his past, his upbringing, and the dozens of victims attributed to the Green River Killer's rampage. Charles Manson. There has been a wealth of interview footage of Charles Manson released over the years, much of which can be used as evidence for the man's often unhinged persona. Do you feel blame? Are you mad? Uh, do you feel like Wooch Kabob from Frenich? Get Frenich, Booch Booch Boogie. And there's a lot of that here from this 1987 interview with Today correspondent Heidi Schulman. I wouldn't do anything that I felt guilty about. You don't feel guilty at all? There's no need to feel guilty. I haven't done anything I'm ashamed of. However, there's also this intent to shatter the myth of Manson as a leader, and this is aided by the visual of Manson's scattershot presence during the interview. Maybe I should have killed four or five hundred people, then I would have felt better. 
them and I felt like I really offered society something. Although the occasionally violent outbursts by Manson have been well documented in this piece, it's the more soft-spoken sound bites that reveal more about the man's own admitted failures and shortcomings. My awareness and my consciousness is not the same as somebody that goes to school and has a mom and dad. See, not having parents have left me in a, another dimension, so to say. Otis Tool. I like to say a whole, a whole city burned down. This interview with Otis Tool is the stuff of nightmares. There are a lot of reasons for this too, not the least of which is Tool's explosive bursts of laughter and absolutely chilling smile. But what do you prefer in life? Uh, sex or fire? Or I like both. <laughs> Additionally, there's the explicit nature of how Tool describes his past crimes, and how he and former associate and fellow killer Henry Lee Lucas seemed to easily disassociate the value of human life. It's just like a bunch of hogs in a cow. The grainy and blown out AV quality of this interview footage only seems to add to the feeling of grime and filth left over by Tool's gleeful accounts and delivery. It's like a drink, a cup of coffee, smoking cigarette. Once you get into the habit, you do it more and more. Ise Sagawa. The Tamatama Suriba Nikuya san no Dana san to Oksan de Futote, Yukaina, Ojin de Stagado, Dobuts no Kaitai no Shikata toka, Nikuno Kirikata toka, Kuashku Oshete Kurimasta. Unlike the majority of our other entries, Ise Sagawa isn't technically a serial killer. However, this interview footage from Vice's interview with a cannibal is too disturbing not to make our list. Sagawa's history of murder is detailed in the documentary, while Issei himself describes the premeditated shooting of his classmate while living and studying in France. Sagawa's obsessions are also detailed in the piece, as well as the legal loopholes that allowed the killer to escape prison time for his actions. Sagawa's quiet and fragile demeanor undercuts his words, all spoken in equally hushed and inoffensive tones. It is a frankly horrifying and unbelievable story. <laughs> Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Eileen Warnos This interview with Eileen Warnos on the eve of her execution is disturbing for a number of reasons. I'm okay. I'm okay. God is going to be there. Jesus Christ is going to be there. All the angels and everything. For starters, there are the crimes for which Warnos was convicted, but there are also the stories Eileen tells about her treatment in prison. They had, they had the intercom on in the room, and they kept lying that it wasn't on, and they were using sonic pressure on my head since 1997. Her accusations of sonic torment and food tampering speak to her paranoia and mental state during this time. And then one day I didn't wash my food off and I was sick for three weeks, almost died a state that gradually reaches a fever pitch during the interview. Yeah, thanks a lot. I lost my life because of it. Couldn't even get a fair trial. Warnos's face as she directly addresses the camera is chilling, and the audience can only stare back into her eyes as the condemned killer accuses society of, quote, railroading and, quote, sabotage. 2019, a rock's supposed to hit you anyhow. You're all going to get nuked. Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.